So, um, I wanted to tell the story of uh, some of my shows that I didn't have uh, videos for and that are gone. And one in particular is called The Battler. And um, I did that in the um, late 1980s in Australia. So that's where I live in Australia right now. I'm in Brisbane at my home. And um, the name The Battler is interesting. Why I chose that is um, I can look at you, right? Yeah, you can look okay, at me. I have to look at that camera. <laughs> and um, uh, I'll look different places because I'm trying to remember things. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not that I'm uh, making things up. It's that I'm trying to remember. Or yeah. I am, and I also go through things yeah. remembering. And um, I, I think I'll, I'll proceed before I explain what the battler is. That... Um, I told you a little bit about it yesterday. I'm here with my friend Casper, who's filming, and, and my colleague. And um, yeah, I have a, a training uh, for my method. My method's very complicated. It would be like a three or four year university program, but that's hard to manifest. So I, um, coincidentally, through intuition or whatever, I came up with this other. Thing that takes about five days to teach. It's called the four articulations. The four articulations are the articulation of the body, the articulation of space or in space, articulation in time or of time, and the articulation of the time-space continuum. And those are the actual clown exercises. But they're also acting and creative exercises and movement exercises. They're not just clown. And so the last exercise of that is um, uh, out of that whole program is uh, telling a story about a clown that you know or that you saw or could even be that you heard about and you tell you know whatever you whatever part of the story you want to tell and I also explain that it could be that you had a uh, aunt or an uncle or a mother may have been a, a clown or, you know the family clown. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be a clown that's a professional with a red nose. There's no definition about what a clown is. So the individual defines that for himself. So I'm actually telling this story. Um, this is like this exercise or the thing that I found. It's actually storytelling, um, which, you know, was before film and video and TV that we used to sit and everybody told stories. And now we can tell the stories, you know, through the media, and um, and that helps us to share them. But something happens when you actually tell a story, and that's what I'm I'm letting you see into me as a clown in my clown's house, as it were. That was the name of another show of mine before the battle. Can I just check this phone? Yes, go ahead. We have a meeting later, so I'll check that. Okay, gonna answer that. Uh, okay, so somebody's going to come and fetch us in a little bit. If, if, I, a while. if I don't nod my head too much, it's because it's going to shake. If I go like, yeah. <laughs> okay. So now, uh, so that's this exercise, but it's the truth about telling about a clown. That the clown, the clowns live not just by their performance, but in the storytelling of the performance mm -hmm. or in of their act in life as clowns so my father for example everybody uh, referred to him as a clown but he was a traveling salesman who let's say should have been a clown but he lived through the depression and had to work so he was used to that uh, and he was very knowledgeable about clown and clown acts and gags and he was very funny he was also very quiet um, he wasn't a very good salesman at all. Um, he was more like a space case, so it's fortunate that he found traveling salesman because he liked to drive, he could listen to the radio, smoke his pipe, smoke a cigarette in the car, see the nature, mm -hmm. and sometimes do some work and sometimes actually earn some income. <laughs> but he's a very, very, very sweet man, very good man, and a wonderful, beautiful father. Mm -hmm. um, 
So a clown can be someone that you know. It doesn't have to be a professional clown. Okay. So now I'm telling this story about the Batman. When I uh, got to Australia after, I had toured here a few times, several times. And then I came here for work that wasn't here. I came for work and it wasn't actually existent. I didn't know until I arrived. And I had no return ticket to anywhere. And I had, uh, I think, around $135, which would, you know, not do much. And my friend who um, was going to arrange the work, the deal was that we were going to rehearse for four weeks and then we were going to go out and tour this show and venues that he was to have arranged. And um, I wrote the show and we were going to rehearse it. And I was going to live in his apartment, his, actually his girlfriend's apartment, but they lived together and I was going to live there for the month. So they were very nice to me, of course, and um, were wonderful hosts. So I could stay there uh, for free. And um, uh, I got work after 10 days and everything was starting to go, you know. And then soon, a couple weeks later, I got a, a share house to live in on the beach and it was like paradise to me. And I was working at the opera house in the, in the opera as a acrobat, comic acrobat, and tumbling and saltos and all that stuff, directed by Sir Robert Heldman. That's another story. Um, but when, when I would meet people and they say, oh, what brought you here and what happened? And I told them I got stranded and I told them this has happened and what else has happened? And, you know, John Bell called me up. I didn't know who he was and he went to hire me to coach him for the physical part of a, a role that he was doing um, at the Seamoth Center for Nimrod Theater and all, lots of, lots of wonderful things happened. And people, uh, Australians, uh, would hear a little bit of my story and they go, oh, you're a real, you're a real battler. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, tell me. And other people would say, oh, you're a real little battler. And others would say, you're a real little Aussie battler. And people would say, oh, you're a real larrikin. So all those things were very profound um, uh, sense of love that these uh, Australian people, many in the arts, of course, that's who I was meeting, were like embracing me and in a way they were welcoming me as an immigrant and saying um, like a kindred spirit even though I was quite different there was something about me that was um, this iconic little Aussie battler even though I'm a kosher one I'm a Jewish one and I'm from born in America and I lived in Europe and things like that there's something um, that they recognized and they were giving me their welcoming. You know, same, um, different cultures have welcoming ceremonies, like indigenous welcoming. And for me, that's how that felt. And it happened repeatedly. Um, so eventually, after I settled here for a couple of years and I, I had the feeling I wanted to create a, another show, and I came up with the idea doing about my life a bit as a, the inner life of a clown, you know? Mm -hmm. So I made it in a trilogy, um, and it's called, the, the whole thing was called The Battler, but part one was The Vaudevillian, and part two was The Writer, and part three was The Businessman. So it's a, to be a clown, you, you have to be an entertainer of some sort, you know, at least you're a performer. You may not call yourself Maybe that's not au fait anymore to say we're entertainers. You know, you have to be an artist or, you know. But um, I looked at the vaudevillian as the entertainer, the performer side of clowning. Then there's the side that you create your own material as a clown. And other people can co-write with you, they can co-create for you, with you, or somebody could actually create a show for you. But very often the clown is the auteur and they create their own work, they write it. Whether it's scripted, or whether it's drawn, or whether it's thought out. But in this case, I, I put it as the writer. And then the third act was the businessman. So also there's a part of clowning where it's not just altruistic love and, and um, uh, healing and benevolence to the public. It's also a business. So many of us who are clowns didn't want to be bankers. We didn't want to be working 
normal jobs, nine to five. We didn't want to be caught in this and that aspect of society. Um, but we still have to uh, forge a way to survive. And some clowns are very good businessmen, in fact. Maybe they're better businessmen than they are clowns. So it's an interesting relationship I was hint hinting at. So act one, the vaudevillian. So um, what would happen? There was, a, there was a phone on stage on a pedestal, right? And it was an old-fashioned phone, like a normal phone where you, uh, you know, had that, you know, it would ring and it would hang up and it would stop ringing. So the lights would come on on stage and the phone would ring. You know, there was a spotlight on it. Depends on the theater. And the phone would ring, and it would ring and ring a few times. And I'd come, uh, I'd come uh, uh, running out, holding on to uh, 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 my coat, and I had a cane in my hand, and and I, um, I would have had a hat. Maybe I had my hat on, and I, I like a little bowler hat, and I'd run out, and I'd uh, go to get the phone, and I, my pants would drop. So the idea was that um, I had just been on the toilet before the performance. So I'd pick up the phone and pick up my pants and do a little bit of shtick with that. And then finally I, I talked on the phone and it was meant to be my, uh, it was my girlfriend, you know, but it was the clown or the character, the vaudevillian's uh, girlfriend. I say, hello. I said, oh, oh, and, and she asked me, how are you? So, so you couldn't hear her voice. There was no voice, but I go, oh, good, good, good. Um, yeah, just about to start. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm going to start just now. Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. What? Uh, I look out in the audience and I go, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's good. Yeah, pretty full. Yeah, huh? How many? And I go like that. My pants would drop, and I go. Um, by this time, probably my hat and cane were on the floor as well. I'd go, one, two, three, one, two, three. And I'd, I'd count the audience, and I'd go, uh, yeah, it's, it's full. And she wanted to know exactly. I'd go, you know, 60, 60. And um, I'd, say, I'd say, okay, okay, thanks. And I'm trying to get off because I need to see the show. I need to start the show, and the audience is already seeing me. So I... Um, I then go, uh, uh, yeah, I do. You know, I, of course I do. Yes, I do. I love you. And oh, that's right. By this time, I had taken my um, pants, I had taken the, the cane at this point, er, earlier, and I had pulled the pants up like that. So if I went like that and I held my muscles here, the cane was like this. You know? mm -hmm. and, um, and of course I got a laugh and then I'm talking to her and I'm going um, oh, I love you and it went I love you and go down. I love you and it would go down of course the audience is laughing and it's a paradox of saying I love you but being upset and the effect it can have on you know the love relationship at that moment anyway so go ahead and say goodbye all right hang up and I got to get everything together, get my pants on, get my coat on, pick the cane up again, put my hat on, and then um, I start uh, my, my vaudeville number. And it was just a uh, uh, cane and hat uh, dance, which was normal for the vaudevillian clowns. They could all do patter, and they could all do a bit of mime, they could all do pratfalls, they could all do a bit of tap dance, and they could all do uh, cane and hat numbers. Okay, so and it was a normal thing. I think there's uh, the film director, uh, not Richard Attenborough, his brother, David Attenborough, the filmmaker. He said that um, uh, no actor, you can't be an actor unless you can at least do a, a cat and cane and uh, hat routine. So he was referring back to the idea that even an actor should be an entertainer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Anyways, I uh, start to do this with the cane, and I do my little dance. I'm not really a dancer in that way, I'm not even a tap dancer. And I go like that, and then I fall down, and I, I get up, and I start again, and I go down. 
And I keep going like that until finally I got the cane and I, and I got there. I go like that with the cane, turn it around and 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 around. And around, and around, and around. And I'd come up and then I'd start to do this other thing. So now I've got control with the cane. And then the, the cane would get stuck like that, you know, and then stand like this. And then find it, go like that, move it. And then they start to pull me. They start to pull me off. And I'd pull back and pull me. And I'd go behind the, there was the wings there, flat. I go like that, and I go like that, and it was stuck there. So I had a colleague backstage hold it, you know? And then I'd go to get it, and the cane would go up. I'd go to get it up, the cane would go down. And then finally it would go like that, and then it would hook me, like the old get the hook, like in vaudeville, if your act wasn't going well. And it'd hook me and take me off. That was the end of Act One. Okay? All right. Can I have some water?